<laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. Hi. 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 They're much better. How's everyone doing? Remember, like, when you're kindergarten, like, boys and girls, hands up. Remember that stick? Yes. Everyone doing okay? Is it raining outside? This building has no windows. This is actually the first time I've ever taught a room with windows. So this is a treat. I can see rain. Is that thunder? Yes. Very good. Well, we will. Is it loud? Wow. Nah, nah. We, we'll bring the thunder in here. OK, how's everyone doing? Everyone doing all right? Everyone doing well? Uh, I passed around the thing to sign in. I'll do the seating chart on Monday in case we're any last minute ads. So if you can still want to change your seats, you're welcome to do that. Uh, let's see. You had a question? Ah, what a, what a perfect question. Uh, so the, the way to find them is actually very easy. If you go to my website, there's a link that says lectures. And if you click that, you'll see these. Okay? And that's me really big. Uh, here's your playlist for property two. And as of yet, there's only one class, which is a class on Monday. So you can watch that, and you could hear me talking. Yes. I actually do watch myself. How was your summer? Yes. I actually, I actually do watch myself. I do go back and watch them because it helps me improve. In fact, the first time I taught, I taught the same class twice and had like a two-hour break. I'd actually watch myself in between, hopefully get better, uh, which doesn't always work. Uh, and if you're so inclined, you can actually see my uh, property two from last year. You can watch all my lectures. And if you click that link that says playlist, you can see effectively the same exact classes, all 27, 28 classes. So for whatever reason you want to look ahead, you're welcome to do that. Again, the videos are not a substitute because you cannot hear any of the students talking, so you miss half the stuff. But if it's a good way to fill in your notes. Okay? Any questions that we, uh, anything, uh, preliminary syllabus or ordering questions, anything in your minds? No? Okay. Any questions that we covered last time, adverse possession, introduction? Anything? No? Okay. All right, well, today we are going to be finishing up adverse possession, okay? And uh, it's a fairly short topic. We stick at the beginning. It doesn't really fit anywhere, so may as well get it out of the way. Um, today we're going to be talking about a continuation of, of last one. So in the last class, we discussed adverse possession. How can someone gain a piece of property effectively by squatting on it? And we talked about different things. We talked about... Uh, uh, the length of period, we talked about claim of title, we talked about color of title, all these different ways of proving it. Today we take on a slightly more tricky set of cases, right? For example, what happens when you have a summer home and you're only there part of the year? What happens when you're mistaken? What happens when you think you're on one piece of land and you're actually on a different piece of land? Or even more complicated, what happens when we're talking not about a piece of land but a piece of personal property, in this case a painting? A chattel, if you will, if you remember that term from torts. So this class will kind of drill into the deeper elements of adverse possession. Uh, and by, by the end of this, you should have a pretty good sense of everything in this topic that we'll need to know. All right. Any questions? All right. Where did I finish off last time? Somewhere. Oh. Don't make me keep track. Where was it? Somewhere? Here you go. Where's you go? Thank you. Okay. You're up. Okay, this will be an easy one. I what? <laughs> all right, you're up next. Oh, no, no, I'm kidding. That's all right. All right, well, so I, I think I was in this ballpark. So here you go, you're up. This will be an easy one. So refresh your memory. What, what are the four elements? Uh, you can go check your notes if you want. Uh, the four elements that we talked about with, with uh, uh, adverse possession, just so we can review. Entry. Okay, entry, good. That's one. The second one? Uh, Very good. What's, what's number three? Continuous. Continuous. Good. And what's number four? Uh, Very good. All right. So these are our four elements. And, I mean, they're not that hard to memorize. You can keep your notes. I don't really care. The exam's open book. But you should at least know these elements well enough. Okay? We discussed at some length what's entry mean. Entry is when you physically enter the property. This is what starts the clock for adverse possession. It also has the effect of signaling to the world that this person is now on the property. Okay? Uh, open and notorious means you have to actually be on the land openly. You can't keep it a secret. Okay? You have to put the owner on notice that you're squatting. Okay? Uh, the continuous one is the period of time. This will vary by state. 
Uh, but in most states, it's two years, three years, five years, six years, ten years, whatever it is. You stay on the land continuously. But we study this doesn't mean you have to stay on the land 24-7, 365. You can come and go and use a land as a person would use that land, which is why in the, um, the first case we talked about, we'll get to in a few minutes, the lower court found that the summer was only used for the summer that was continuous. That was clearly wrong, and that judge obviously missed his, his property lectures. The most complicated one is the last one. That's, I think, what we spent most of our time in class with on Monday. It's this adverse and under a, a claim of right. And I tried to explain that this concept actually has two elements. It's You can talk about some sort of claim of title, and you also talk about a state of mind. Okay? And what do I mean by this? Different courts use the fourth element in different contexts. Okay? Sometimes your claim of right refers to your state of mind. Right? Are you an aggressive trespasser? Are you saying... I'm going to stay here deliberately. It's going to be mine. Or maybe you make a good faith mistake. You say, well, you know, uh, I thought it was mine, but whoops, I, I made a mistake. Or is this a case where you don't even know what's up. You're just staying in a piece of land because whatever. Different courts take different approaches towards a state of mind. The more modern approach, the, the modern approach, is that your state of mind doesn't matter. If you're on the period of land for a number of years, you're probably going to be okay. The more common law approach, the approach we use here in our, our fine state of Texas, is you have to have some sort of uh, aggressive state of mind, right? You have to know that you're squatting on a piece of land and be open about it. Okay? But that's not the only way that you can show some sort of claim of right. You can also show you have some sort of claim of title. And these terms are very similar, so try to keep them a little bit separated. Okay? And what's your claim of title? Uh, this is often what's called, uh, sometimes called, color of title. I know these terms are terrible. You have claim of right, claim of title, and color of title. Try to keep them separate. The color of title refers to, for example, a bad deed, a fraudulent deed, right? Someone gave you a bad deed, saying that you owned a piece of land. It turned out the deed was a piece of garbage. It wasn't worth the paper it was printed on. But you still had that, and you relied on it, and you said... My claim of right to this land is this deed. Now, it turned out to be false. But you may be in luck still. Why? If you held on to that deed for a certain number of years and you lived there openly, notoriously, and you continuously stayed there, the land's now yours. right? If you have that, that deed, that piece of paper, and you stay there for however many years, like, like remember Mr. Robinson in the house? He filled out that, that affidavit, right? Had he actually stayed there for, I think, three years, he would have probably, or maybe six years, depending how you look at it, he would have been there long enough, and that would have been his house. Okay. So does everyone get that much? This is review. Nothing new here. Everyone okay with that? Questions? No? Okay. All right, so then let's move on to the case for today. The, the, the Howard versus, repeat for me, Kunto. Got it? Kunto. Good. Trust me. So, let's do the first case. This case involves really elements number uh, uh, three, kind of two, and kind of four. One's not really an issue here. Right? And uh, the facts of this case are actually very, very, very messy. Um, uh, this, is, this is a classic law school case because the facts are so messed up. All right. So, um, okay. So, ma'am, what's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca. Uh, actually, before you go there, has anyone ever been to Washington? Has anyone ever actually been to the Hood Canal? Anyone? It's 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 quite beautiful. I found some pictures of it. Um, it's basically these rivers uh, that that go through these cliffs. It's very pretty. And as you might imagine, the real estate here is very very expensive. And a 50 feet plot of land, which doesn't seem like very much uh, in Texas, is waterfront property that's probably goes for millions of dollars. Okay? So let's try to walk through the facts of this case very slowly. Um, we'll start with you, but we won't finish with you. <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, yeah, no, so no, we'll take our time with this. The facts of this one are annoyingly complicated, but I think it would actually be a good exercise in um, understanding uh, uh, how this land use stuff works. So. High level. Don't go into different plots. What was the major problem here? So there's a 50-foot 
parcel at issue here. Uh -huh. And so what, this is important because it's, first of all, it's a recreational retreat on waterfront property. Uh -huh. That makes it important as well. And uh, there are several conveniences throughout time. And because of that, we want to figure out. Um, and there was a mistake with the deed. Okay. Kind of talking about. Yes, okay. So there's a lot of stuff going on here. So before we get down to the details, again, this is this is going to wrap your minds. We'll be on this for a couple minutes. Everyone was living on the wrong plot of land, right? That's the conclusion. Everyone was basically 50 feet over from where they were supposed to. So let's, before you get to names, right? There's a house here on C, right? The house on C, the landowner actually owned the one next to it, okay? There's a house on B. The landowner actually owned the one next to it. And this was a mistake that had been going on since the 1930s. So generation after generation of homeowners, this went through several transactions. I don't really care about the transaction who sold to whom for now. But many people sold to each other on the mistaken premises. Okay? So everyone, everyone has this diagram in your book. If you can't see the board, you can flip to your book. Okay, so there were four plots here of land. A, B, C, and D. Okay? Let's just get to the land, all right? Okay. We have two major people. We have Howard and we have Kunta, right? Okay. Here's the problem that arises. Kunta's house, this one right here, Kunto's house is on lot C. Which one does Kunto own? D. So effectively, he owned a piece of unoccupied land. But his house is on C. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Now, who owns C? Moyer. Okay. Moyer falls out of the picture. Don't worry about Moyer. Why? Because Moyer conveys his interest to B, Howard. Okay. Why? Well, because Moyer's house is over here. Right? So Moyer did something smart. He's like, oh, wait a minute. My house, right? My, my house is here, but I own this one. Let me buy this plot of land. Right? So Moyer buys B from Kunto. So at this point, Moyer is out of the picture. Don't worry about Moyer. The only thing we need to worry about is lot C. That's all we're worrying about. On lot C is Kunto's house. But who owns lot C now? Howard. Everyone see that? I tried to do this as clear as I can, but this is messy. The only circumstance we care about at this point is the ownership of Lot C. On Lot C is Kunto's house, but Howard is the record owner of Lot C. C is a disputed area, right? We don't care about the other ones at this moment, so all we care about is C. All right, everyone get that? Any questions? Stop me if you don't, because otherwise it won't make sense. All right. All right, so with that at issue, C is that issue. So Howard goes, hey, guess what? That's my house. Oh. Now, we all know this. Maybe we don't think about it clearly enough. Usually when you buy a house, you're not actually buying the house. You're buying the land underneath it, right? You usually don't own your home in that sense. You own the land. And obviously, whatever is on top of the land is yours. So if it were true right, that Howard owned Lot C, Howard would also have the house on Lot C, which would make Mr. Kunto homeless or something like that. I'm sure, I'm sure he's well off if he has a house in the Hood Canal, but he'd be without a house or a summer home. Uh, I guess he's looking at a summer home. You know, Lysol's rich and famous, right? Okay, so how is this... How is this claim going to be resolved? Okay. So, uh, sir, what's your name? Garrett. Garrett? Yes. Okay, so what are the different arguments? What's Howard going to argue, and what's Kunto going to argue about Lot C? 
Howard is going to argue that he properly purchased it uh, through his dealings with Moyer, uh -huh. that he's now the rightful owner of the land because he holds the deed. However, uh, Kunto will argue that he has always lived there, therefore he's the proper owner, per perhaps because he's adversely possessed it. Okay, good. Okay, so this is a case where adverse possession will actually decide the ownership of this land, right? We're not talking about a, a staircase that goes over a property line or, or, or something else. This is actually the dude loses his house if he loses, right? Okay. So the first element is easy enough, which is entry, right? There's no, there's no question that um, Kunto is living on that land. The second element, continuous, is a little bit trickier. And what's your name? Angela, tell me. Explain to me the, the continuous element in this case. Um, I think Kunto took the possession, or I think it was the mailer's summer home. Mm -hmm. And then so they moved in in 1916 or something like that. And so I guess Howard was trying to say, like, they haven't been here that long. Okay. So then the issue of tacking came. Good. Okay, okay, oh good. Tell me, what, what's this tacking business? They're trying to add up like, the, the amount that the millers were there with the amount that countries were there so they can, you know, need to make more out of Okay, very good. All right, so I think someone asked me this question. I told you, ask me again later. What happens when you have two different parties <laughs> who are each squatting on the same piece of land? Neither of them independently were there long enough, right? So say, make things easy. Let's say the limit's 10 years, right? The first family was there for five years, and then the second family is there for five years. Combined, they've hit 10 years, right? But who's making the claim? Only one of the families, not both of them. They're not living in the same unit. So how do we deal with this? This is something we call tacking, right? Which is something which uh, uh, we have in adverse possession. Generally speaking, and we'll, we'll do some of the questions on this later, but generally speaking, two different parties can combine or tack together their periods to fit the continuous requirement. And I'll show you um, the way it's phrased. Uh, I, the, here's the Texas uh, rule on tacking. So this might be a little bit too small for you to read. I'll make it bigger. It's uh, tacking of successive interests. Uh, to satisfy a limitations period, Peaceful and adverse possession does not need to continue the same person, but there must be privity of estate between each holder and his successor. Okay, what does this mean? What's this privity of estate? You've seen this word privity before. Uh, so what's your name? Joseph? Where have we seen this word privity before? See if you can remember back to before the summer started. Um, it just means that there's a close relationship. Yeah, what class did you see the word privity in? You're right. But, yeah, in what, what context? Um, uh, Oh. They have privity of, of ah, and maybe so in torts also, maybe? Privity of contract. What, so what does privity mean? You said it before correctly. Oh, it's a mutual or successful relationship with the same right of property. Uh, can enforce it. Did you read that? Yes. Okay. I, I didn't know. I forgot what it meant. That, that's good. So if you don't know a term, look it up. That's actually a very good thing to do. That's a, that's a, yeah, that, that's fine. Dictionaries are very useful things. Yes, privity means you have some sort of relationship. You have privity of contract. That's where two people were engaging in a contract. We'll come back to this term a few times this semester. Uh, but here, for example, this privity of estate means that you have a relationship with the previous owner. So person A sold to person B, right? Person A sold to person B. Is there privity there? Yes. So can they tack? The answer is yes. Actually, let's do some questions. Actually, it's a good opportunity now. In, in your book, page 149. Hold on. I think that's the right page. I'm out of order, but I think we'll do it now. Oh, it's 148. 148. Okay. And um, take a look at the, the, the first question. Uh, I'm, I'm paragraph one. Can you uh, So, what's your name? Great. Trey, can you please read the, the, this first paragraph on page 148? It's at the bottom question. It says question one. Okay. In 2008, he entered adversely upon Blackacre, owned by O. In 2007, B tells A, get out of here, I'm taking over. Mm -hmm. A, feeling threatened, leaves, and B enters into the 
2010, who owns Blackacre? Okay, stop right there. What do you think? So we have a situation where, you know, O is the record owner, A enters, starts squatting, he's there for seven years, and B says, scram, get out. And then he's there for another three years. So between the two of them, they've hit ten years, but independently they haven't hit it together. Do you think you have this privity? Um, I don't believe so. How come? Uh, there's... There's no real agreement between the two. Uh -huh. It's more of um, kind of a disagreement, really. Yeah, they're a fight, right? Yeah. Privity suggests an actual relationship between two parties, right? There doesn't need to be something in writing, but some sort of agreement that, okay, I'm going to transfer this to you for something, right? Here, there's actually an adversarial nature, so they don't have that, okay? All right, uh... Okay. All right, so that's good. All right, let's try question number <coughs> two. Actually, no. Mm. Yeah, let's try question number two. All right, sir, can you read question number two, please? Sure. On the next page. In 1994, A enters adversely upon Blackacre, owned by O. In 1995, O dies, leaving a will that devises Black Acre to be for life, remainder to see. In 2010, B dies without ever having Black Acre. Who owns Black Acre? Okay, what do you think happens here? Who do you think owns it? A or, uh, or O? I'm sorry, or A or B? I'm going to say A because B never enters. Ah, that's a good point, right? Well, let me ask you a different question, right? So the will was written in 1995, right? At what point was the land actually transferred, presumably, by, 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 by purpose of the will? In other words, when, when, did, when, did, uh, when did the will go into effect, right? Well, when O dies, but, but B dies. Right. So the remainder to C. Okay. So here what happens, what's interesting, is just because you leave some land in your will to someone else, if you don't have it, you can't convey it. So just because, like, for example, say I leave my will today, you know, I live to you a million dollars, right? If I die and I don't have a million dollars, you're not going to get it. Obviously, right? So even though the will left Blackacre to be for life, by the time B died in 2000, A had already acquired it by adverse possession. Everyone see that? A had acquired it already, and there was nothing left for C. Yeah? So what, what type of privity is required? Privity of estate or privity of contract? Uh, we'll do that question like in a month. But at this point, don't worry about the difference. There is a difference, but we'll do this when we do easements. Yep. All right. So everyone see that? There has to be some sort of relationship between the two parties. And, and for now, an agreement is sufficient. Okay. All right, let's go back to the um, case. So the first issue, and I think we, we, we will discuss this, is it's possible for Kunto and his predecessor to tack together their times, right? Everyone, everyone agree with that much. So it's not necessary for one person to do all 10 years by himself. You can have two parties who add up the time. Okay? The other issue that the court addressed somewhat quickly uh, was the fact that it was a summer home. So what's your name? Eric. Eric, does the fact that the summer home... And they're only there during the summer to feed continuity? Uh, no, sir. How come? Because the court relies on the fact that, there's, that, the, uh, that Kuto is using the land as others would in mm -hmm. a similar situation. It's property that is being used as a summer home in the summer. Okay, that's exactly right. For purposes of continuity, you only need to use a land as a reasonable person would use that land. If it's a summer home, you should be there in the summer. If it's a winter home, you should be there in the winter. If it's, you know, a ski resort, when there's snow, you should probably be there. Okay? All right, everyone with me so far? Okay, the, the trickier element has to do with the claim of right. Okay? So let's go back to the, uh, the case we did uh, last, uh, last class. What's your name? Shamira. Shamira. What was the... Remember the case where the cement staircase went over the boundary line? Did anyone there even know that there was a problem there? 
So what was lacking in that case? Why, why didn't the, uh, why wasn't there a valid claim for adverse possession? Um, I guess it wasn't um, possible if he wasn't doing it intentionally. I guess. Well, yes, but but more so, which element do you think was lacking in that one? You can check your notes if you want. We'll go through them. Yes, right. So the problem in that case was that it wasn't notorious. No one knew that the staircase went over the line. Remember it was like 15 inches or something? So no one even knew. Okay, I'll go right back up there. My friend, what's your name again? John. Okay, so here, did anyone know that the property was on the wrong part of the land? Okay. So here's the deal. The open and notorious element and the claim of right element blend a little bit. That's why Shamira said she wasn't really sure which one it was. They, they blend a little bit, and I'm going to explain how. So John's exactly right. Here, no one in that property, right, no one here on that block knew that they were off by 50 feet. So arguably, there was no notorious and open using of the land. But even more than that, Okay. So what's your name? Sean. Sean. But even more than that, if you don't know that on a piece of land because they didn't know which one they were squatting on, can you have a claim of right? Uh, no, you have to know that there's one. Exactly. Okay. And this is more the common law approach. He's exactly right. If you don't even know you're on the wrong piece of land, you have no claim of right. <coughs> you. Uh, under a common law standard, we have to have a state of mind, right? You need to know that you're actually squatting. Did Kunta living there all those years think he was squatting? He didn't. So in this case, on the fourth element, which is mostly what the court resolved it on, the claim of right fails. Kunto didn't know that he was squatting. Kunto's predecessor didn't know he was squatting. The sale between those two made no reference to, this, to the fact that the property lines were wrong. So the court effectively... Uh, uh, would find the court would find I think they probably should have, we'll, we'll see what they did in a minute, that there was no good claim of right. But that's not what they do. I'm saying what probably should have happened, right? This is probably based on how what we've said before, this is probably what the law would compel. But the court didn't quite do that. So ma'am, what's your name? Catherine, but the court didn't do that. What what the court do here? How how did they how, how did they resolve this in a way that probably was not consistent with the common law approach? Okay, tell me what you mean by good faith. Tell me what you mean by good faith. You're right. Right. Okay. Good. So remember where I said the modern trend, not the common law, but the modern trend is that the state of mind isn't quite as important. You don't have to be a hostile trespasser, right? The modern approach is you don't have to know that you're squatting. So like, for example, Mr. Kunto, he had no idea. But you know what? He had a good faith belief that that was his property. Surveys were difficult to measure, and that was good enough for him. Right? So if you effectively, after you read this entire opinion, you're probably thinking, oh, this guy's going to lose, this guy's going to lose. And at the last minute, they pull it out and say, oh, but wait a minute. He relied in good faith. He had an erroneous deed, meaning he had some color of title. He had, he had, a, he had a bad deed in his hand. That's good enough. Okay? I think the court probably felt bad for Mr. Uh, Mr. Kunto because he had been living there for many years, and then out of the blue, this jerk Howard comes by, and he buys a plot of land where his house is. Imagine this, if any of you own homes, right? You've been living in your house for all these years, and then suddenly some dude buys a land beneath your house. You don't even know. So I think there was some equitable play, you know, some fairness at issue. We see this a lot in the second case, the, the George O'Keefe case, right? So the court basically says... You know what? He was there in good faith. That's good enough for me. So this represents more of the modern trend for adverse possession law. Okay. Questions?
questions. All right. Uh, so you just walked in. What, what do you think about this case? You think this? You think the resolution of this case was right? The, the resolution of the the, the Kuto case. What the, what shouldn't apply? Sir, what's your name? Alex. Alex, give me an argument in favor of the common law approach. The common law approach says you need to have some sort of state of mind that you know you're squatting. What, get, argue in favor of that, please. Yeah, argue for the common law. Well, in this case, which, which one prefer the common law? Howard or Kunto? Yeah, Howard says common law rule. He didn't have the right state of mind, he, he loses. So give me, give, me, give me the argument in favor of using the common law here. I'm sure Howard would say that, but why? Why should the court stick to the common law here? What, 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 how, what's the policy rationale? What conduct does that policy encourage? Got it, Pamela Jane. Haley. Haley, what's? Why? Why would the court stick to the common law? What? What conduct does that encourage? It would create certainty. Good. What do you mean it creates certainty? Well, it's confusing enough of the facts that. <laughs> Under the common law standard, who keeps it? No. Because? But even more importantly, what did what did Howard do to get the land? He bought it, and he had and he had record notice, right? He had record title. So the common law approach promotes certainty in one respect. Right? If you have the correct deed, it's yours. If you have a deed based on that survey, you lose. So if anything else, it promotes good survey technology. So uh, uh, this might be a particularly, everyone knows what I mean by survey. I, I should have mentioned that at the outset, I apologize. Um, surveying refers to measuring pieces of land. Okay. Now, in the Von Valkenburg case, we have this very nice map. Remember I drew that map with all the different lots that were numbered? That's usually not done in many places. If you have some waterfront properly along these very jagged cliffs, it's going to be difficult to map these out under normal circumstances. So you might have a deed that says 50 feet from the tree to the rock to the water or something like that. Remember, meets and bounds. You might have said that before. These are very... Um, tricky measurements that are difficult to calculate. As a result, for like 40 years, every one of this block was in the wrong piece of land. Okay? But now imagine, right? Imagine the court took a different holding, right? <laughs> so ma'am, what's your name? Aisha. So imagine the court ruled for Mr. Howard, right? What would happen to this entire block? <laughs> Everybody Everyone would be screwed. Everyone would be screwed. I don't say this lightly. I, the, the book alludes to it, but there were a lot of people who were all off by 50 feet. Imagine if they were all then displaced from their homes. That would have been very disruptive to a very affluent community. So I think, I think the equity is way there as well. Although, uh, ma'am, what's your name? Katie, what's one really easy way of fixing this? Real easy. Switch. Yeah. I mean, in fairness, that's what Moyers did, right? Moyers said, uh-oh, my house is in the wrong lot. Let me, let me get this guy's lot, and I'll be, I'll be good. The only problem was they left Kunto out of the equation because they tried to say Kunto some away from him. So if everyone just basically bought the lot of their neighbor, they would have been okay. Except, if you think about it, the one guy at the very end <laughs> would have no one to buy, and he'd go off the cliff or something. I don't even know. Um, so <laughs> you have the situation where this was probably the, the better equitable solution, but it, it, it disregarded a lot of the common law standard. And if you read the book, it actually mentioned that um, the Washington Supreme Court reversed this, and they found that you still need to have some sort of a uh, 
good faith, you know, some sort of state of mind. So this wasn't the final solution. This was a, uh, I think, result. This is an intermediate court of appeals decision. Okay. All right. Any questions on this case? Yes, ma'am. I just want to clarify: common law requires like an aggressive state of mind. Or... Either aggressive or alternatively, like at least a good faith effort that you know you're squatting. Versus the modern one, the state of mind is almost irrelevant. You don't even need to know you're squatting. Like, you could be squatting right now and you don't even know it. Shmer? It can't be simultaneously. They have to be like one after the other. Oh, yeah. Like, so if I, say there are two people each there for five years, that's not enough. It has to be five years, privity, five years. It doesn't them. need to be in writing, um, which is somewhat counterintuitive. But there has to be some sort of agreement. So, example, the, the question we did from the book a minute ago, where someone kicks someone off their land, that's not sufficient. There has to be, there has to be an agreement that they can continue their tacking together. Questions? I saw a hand. Anyone else? Is that a hand? Wrist. Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am. So, wait. This got reversed afterwards. This not this case, this doctrine. Yes, in a different case, the court reverse it later. So we still go with the common law now? Uh, it would depend on what your jurisdiction. I'm going to preempt a question, which I know I get every every class. Um, on the exam, I'll tell you if this is a common law or a modern approach. You, you'll know. Um, I'll, I'll tell you. I'm not going to try to try to trick you on that. Um, you should know that within the common law, there are different standards. Like she just asked, sometimes there's an aggressive trespasser, sometimes there's good faith. But there are general uh, uh, separations between the two. And I'll, I'll tell you this again. Um, we haven't mentioned this yet, but there are restatements in property. They're not very influential at all. But the first restatement of property is effectively common law. The third restatement, which is the recent one, the third restatement is effectively modern. So I might use either term. Uh, but there usually is, in a couple of cases, differences between the first and the third restatements. Yes, ma'am. But if we use the common law approach, then doesn't that just reinforce the, the common belief that this is just a glorified way to let people take other people's stuff because it cuts out all of the people who actually have a problem even though they did nothing wrong and they were completely honest about it. Um, and it takes all of those people and leaves them out and only helps the people who are trying to take other people's human. Common law wasn't always about helping people. That usually wasn't the goal of the common law. The common law promotes some sort of certainty where you need to have someone who actively was trying to squat. Let's focus on open and notorious here for a minute, right? I think that's the easy way to resolve this case. There was no open and notorious squatting. No one knew that people were on the wrong plot of land, so there's no way to kick them out. Right? Say, for example, in this case, one of the neighbors had done a survey and said, hey, wait a minute, Kunto, you're on the wrong piece of land. Scram, get out ejected him, right? That would have resolved the problem. But since there was no notorious and open showing, no one even knew to eject anyone. So everyone continued for all those years. In my mind, I think the court probably missed this in a couple of the notorious element was, was, was seriously lacking, and that could resolve the case. Right? If you don't know someone's on your land, you can't get adverse possession, period. Because there's no way for you know to kick them off. Okay? All right, other questions? Yes, sir? Can you take into account, like, if you're doing the good faith, like, looking at the equities, whether or not you can indemnify a third person? In the next case, they indemnify a person who sold the painting to them. Uh, yeah, I mean, once you start balancing equities, you can throw whatever you want into the pot. Equ yeah, I mean, it seems like a lot of these you just blame the surveyor. Well, 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 yeah, so you sh the surveyor should have some blame, but it seems there were two surveyors who messed up here. Or maybe the second one just copied the first one, didn't really do it a thorough job. Um, you'll do this also when, when we do um, title searches, right? So, for example, say before you buy a house, you want to make sure the person selling it to you actually has it to sell. You do a title search. You hire a title search company. Say the title search company messes up. Say they say, oh, yeah, this guy owns it free and clear, right? Turns out someone else owns it. With title insurance, the insurance company actually will pay you for the property value if they messed up. So there are different ways. I don't know if a surveyor will uh, cover the cost of a bad survey. I don't know what their liability is like. 
But with title insurance, you get just that. I'm sure you could actually buy an insurance policy for the dimensions of a piece of land in the event there's a mistake. I'm sure you'll sell, people will sell insurance for anything. Uh, so I'm sure there's a policy that exists to cover that. Every, there's insurance for everything. Okay, other questions? No? Okay. All right, so we did hacking. Uh, one other issue to talk about is disability. Um, and disability... Oh, so question here. Is Howard out of the money? Yeah, Howard's screwed. And think about it this way, right? Howard gave his land to Moyer, right? And exchange, Howard's supposed to get this plot of land. So basically, Howard got nothing. He, he lost out. So I don't know uh, Zoe was upset that people getting hurt. Mr. Howard bought a piece of land. He got nothing for it. Although, in slight fairness, Howard deliberately bought a piece of land that someone else was living on, hoping he can get it through legal technicalities, like adverse possession. <laughs> so he was kind of a jerk. So I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll let you decide how you think about that one, but it can go either way. All right, let's talk about disability for a second. Okay. So generally, you might remember in contract law, right? What happens if you make a contract with a minor? What's your name, sir? Adam. Adam, what happens if you write a contract with a minor? Uh, voidable. voidable, right? Not necessarily void, right? You said the right word. Right, so say if for whatever reason the minor comes back and says, oh, I didn't mean that, the court can actually strike down the contract. There's a similar doctrine in property, right? Where say the owner of a piece of property is a child. Right? The same way we can't expect a child to, to consent to a contract, we can't expect a child to know someone's squatting on their land. Right? They don't have the legal capacity to know that someone's squatting. So say, you know, the easiest example, say you start squatting on a piece of land and the owner of it is 10 years old. Until that child turns 18, the adverse possession clock doesn't run. Right? You can't run the adverse possession clock against someone with a disability. Okay? That's the general. Yes, sir. What if somebody's holding the land for the child until he turns 18? Um, so if there's a, a, a trustee, which is the word, uh, I'm pretty sure the trustee would then be on notice. Uh, um, it, it's, it gets a little tricky with trust, but let's stay with the simple case where the child's owning himself. We'll do trust later in the semester, but let's keep it nice and simple now. Um, if there's a disability at the time of the entry, right, very careful. If there's a disability at the time of an entry, so long as that disability exists, the adverse possession clock is stopped. Okay. So the most common disability, and by the way, this, this is the Texas um, disability statute, right? So there's only two categories under Texas law. <laughs> Younger than 18 years of age and of unsound mind, which I'm not even sure how Texas courts define that, but I'm guessing not quite broadly. Okay? Unsound mind. Other states have actually very elaborate ones. For example, a student told me in some states, if you're in the military, uh, the statute can't run against you if you're overseas. Uh, if you're in prison, the statute can't run against you, which I think makes sense because you can't really do anything about it. You're in jail. Um, although that's, part, that's not a very Texas thing to add. So the trick is if on entry, first element, entry, if on entry there's a disability, the clock doesn't start. So say you walk onto a piece of property and the person is only 10 years old, right? At what point does the clock start ticking, sir? The child's 10 years old. At what point does the clock start ticking? When they turn 18, you get to it. The clock starts ticking. So even if you're living there for eight years, openly and notoriously, until the kid turns 18, it doesn't matter. Okay, so what's your name? Yeah. Kevin. All right, well, what happens if on entry, the day you enter, right? The person is of unsound mind. Say he has, say he had a, a, a debilitating stroke and he's like, you know, on, on life support. And he's on life support for, say, 20 years. What happens there? Never starts running. Never starts running. Okay. Usually, a child will eventually age out of 
childhood. That usually happens unless if something happens and dies. But with unsound mind, it can last indefinitely. And ma'am, what happens if say the person has, you know, goes into a coma and then comes out of the coma after three years, right? When does the clock start running? Exactly right. After the three years. Okay? Everyone get that? Now, slightly different story. And what's your name? Leda. Leda. So, Leda, tell me, what happens if you enter on in 2010 and in 2011, guy gets into a car accident, owner gets into a car accident, goes into a coma, and he's in a coma for five years? Does the clock run in that case? Why? Because he was a strong line with the guy. So the, the, the coma came after entry. It's not right. Ma'am, what's your name? Victoria. Victoria, what happens there? What happens when the coma begins after the person enters, the year afterwards? Yeah. Read read for me letter D if you can oh if you can't read this. Just. Exactly. Okay. If the disability starts after the entry, right? So if I enter in 2010 and the owner goes into a coma in 2011, the clock keeps ticking, right? Why do you think this is? So why, why, do, you think, why do you think we don't toll disabilities that start afterwards? What's your name, sir? Oh, Mike. Mike, why do you think the clock keeps running if the disability starts later? Well, the disability starts after the entry occurred. They still have time to realize the entry. Exactly. Exactly right. At the time of entry, and it was open and notorious, the owner was on notice, and he could have done stuff to kick the guy out. Keep in mind, the entire purpose of adverse possession statutes is to give time to kick out the squatter. That's why we have these time limits. And if you sit on your butt and you don't do anything about it, you're in trouble. Now, I realize a coma is a little bit of an unfair circumstance, so what they do is they don't pause the clock. You still have that additional time. Hopefully, someone else can help you. Sir? I'm going to say, is that a cut and dry rule? Say someone enters onto your land, it's the first weekend of June. You're not going to go down from mid-June. And, you know, on your way down, they use a fire. Is that cut and dry? Let's do some questions. On page 140, 149, there's some questions. We'll do those in a second. But, sir, I think your hand was up also? Okay. Let, let's do some questions. They, they may or may not. Uh, answer your uh, um, issues. Where was I up to? Okay. Uh, so what's your name? Zach. Zach. Okay. Zach, uh, read for me um, uh, the question number uh, starting here where it says, uh, yeah, start starting there. When in the following? Uh, when you follow examples where the adverse position required title, title in each case, it was the owner in 1984 and eight years. Okay, so here we have the case. O is the owner in 1984. A starts squatting in 1984, and the age majority is 18. All right, so Zach, uh, uh, please read uh, uh, number one. O is insane in 1984. O dies insane in intestate in 2007. Okay, so here we have a case. We're at the time of entry, right? The enter happens in 1984. O's already insane, and he dies insane in 2007. Okay, Zach. In this case, did the clock ever start running? If he was insane at the time of entry, that's correct. The clock never started running. So even though A was there for what, 23 years, it doesn't matter because the clock never started ticking. So in this case, O uh, uh, O had it at the time of his death. Everyone see that? Okay. So what's your name? Parson. Parson? Parson. Parson. So, okay, so then read, uh, go, go to letter A, please. I was, I was gonna, uh, Aaron H. Okay. Does, does, does O inherit, I'm sorry, does H inherit anything in this case? Is he still insane? Well, O died insane, right? Yeah. So do, what do, does H inherit anything? Well, why not? Well, 
What happens if the clock never starts? Does, is there any adverse possession? No. So who owns it at O's death? Why? You're right, but say why. Right, the day before O dies, who owns it? O dies, who owns it? That's right, O still owns it. O never lost it. A never got it through adverse possession. O had it the entire time. So when O dies, who gets it? The H, the air gets it. Everyone see that? The clock, the adverse possession clock never starts ticking. Never get to 10 years, the original owner keeps it. Okay? All right, uh, switch name? Jordan. Jordan. Okay, read, read letter B, please. O's heir H is six years old in 2007. Okay, does that, does that change the fact that, that um, H was a minor in 2007? Does that matter? Um, I don't think it does, because I don't think you can compile two of them to extend it. Okay, and that's exactly right. I was going to get there, but you, you stole my thunder. So, so read, read letter C from the from this statute, if you can read it. person may not pack one legal disability to another to the limitations. Okay, that's exactly right. You can't tack disabilities. You get one bite at the apple, right? So say the father, O, was mentally unsound, and then say the heir, H, was a child, no go. You only get one bite, right? Everyone okay with there? Yeah. So the clock would start. When does the clock start ticking? If he's the heir, I would say... When, oh, well, think about it. When does the clock start ticking? O died. What happened to his insanity? Poof. So when does the clock start ticking? That's right. Then H gets it. Okay? The minute H gets it, the 10-year clock starts ticking. So if we go forward to 2017 and A was still there, A would not own it. This is like the last case when... <laughs> The remainder was left as easy. Kind of yes. Back. Once once the remainder man, right, once C gets it, we got the clock start running. Even if even if H is a minor, it doesn't matter. So H would still be under an obligation to kick out the squatter. Yep, you cannot hack disabilities. It's the same standard. Yep. Same standard. Even if they're a minor. All right. Yes, sir. Yes, that's the same rule everywhere. You cannot tax disabilities. So let's try number two. So, what's your name in the back? Andrew. Andrew. Okay, read number two, please. Okay. What happens here? What do you think happens here? O has no disability in 1984, and he dies in 2002, and then presumably H inherits it. Who is the actual owner? Why? Good. When did A get it? Well, A entered in 1984, right? So when does A get it? The ten-year period. Exactly. No, exactly. A gets it in 1994. It's by 2002. It doesn't even matter anymore. A's owned it now for eight years because A was never ejected. Okay. Let's try a little trickier question. Sir, in the back, what's your name? Zach. Zach. Yes. Okay. Read, read number three, please. <laughs> Okay, all right. All right, so here's the situation. O is five years old in 1984, right? So when is, just based on that, when's he going to reach maturity? Right, 13 years, he turns 18, right? So he'll reach maturity in 1987. But in 1994, when the, when the kid turns 10, he becomes mentally ill. 
does the fact that he becomes mentally ill in, 2000, in um, 1994 change anything? That's right. You cannot tack disabilities. So even though the child becomes mentally ill in 1994, uh, uh, the clock keeps, or I'm sorry, the clock, when does the clock start? The clock starts in 97. In other words, the clock will start in 97 no matter what. Nothing will stop it from uh, uh, tolling again. Yes? The clock starts in 97. That's right. That's when he's already been in 94. That's right. The clock starts in 1997 because that's when he turns 18. Nothing to do with his mentally ill status. We know, well, think about it this way. What's his disability in 1984? His age. His age. And then we know when his, age, when his disability will run out, right? His disability will run out in 1997. So once 1997 hits, we start running the clock. Okay? So the answer is, yes, sir? You choose which No. <laughs> you want the longer one, right? No, you get whichever one comes first. If your age comes first, then that's when you're stuck with. You can't pick and choose your disabilities. It's a, it's a, it's a gruesome thought, really. But um, all right, all right. So 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 round it up. What year does the uh, what year would A get it? 2005 or 2007? 2007. Why? Ten years from the kid turned 18. Does everyone get that? Yes, ma'am. So the owner is an insane six-year-old. Oh, and which one would? <laughs> an insane six-year-old. Well, I think that goes to this question. They'll probably choose the uh, the laundry disability. Well, actually, which one came first? Oh, which disability came first? Him being under eighteen or being insane? But if they're uh, both in effect. No, no, no. What that's what my if, question. What if which <laughs> which <laughs> came first? <laughs> which came first? Being under eighteen or having a disability in the head? Because you're born immediately, and the second you pop out, you are a, you are disabled, right? <laughs> you are you are a minor, and then perhaps later you're diagnosed with some sort of mental condition. But the first disability, I'm sorry, will probably be your age, and that will end always. But what if possession starts while both are effective? But it's which disability happened first. That's that's my point. You get you turn under 18 first, sir. But uh, <laughs> what if the kid is diagnosed with a disability before it's born? Oh man, a prenatal. <laughs> yeah, what if what if they were born mentally? Oh, but they were born first. I actually I don't know the answer to that. Oh, oh, I think you're born first, even with a diagnosis. But actually, the the property law you say this in, in first year respects the rights of fetuses with their property, right? Fetuses can actually inherit properties, but consider persons before they are first law. I don't know the answer to this question. I'm pretty sure if I had to guess that the uh, I've gotten that question before, but not this question before. <laughs> That you're born first, and that's your disability. So I think that's probably uh, the case. And in, in the practical purposes, most most children can't be diagnosed with diseases until they're at some age where they communicate or give signals. So I, I don't know if you can be diagnosed as a newborn one day old with with uh, uh, let's see, maybe, but I'm gonna go with birth. birth. All right, other questions? Other questions? Yes, ma'am. So this is only in instances. 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 The squatter's already on the land. So, so if, if, if yes, only where the entry happens, only where the disability is before the entry. That's right. Yes, sir. From 1997 moving forward, O or H has the ability to make that person. Yes, sir. So he would have to exercise. Another time. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Even though he's a minor or, or whatever, I'm sorry, even though he now has a mental condition, he would still be under an obligation to kick him out. And I think that it's kind of fair because he knew about it in advance, so there is time. Yes? So if he is a six-year-old crazy person <laughs> and then the squatter comes, you still can't choose which... I, I would still go with the disability period of age. I mean, I, I can look this up later. I'm pretty sure you go with whichever one happened first. It makes sense. All right, other questions? Anyone else? <laughs> Can we move on? Do that? Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I, not in Texas, but I think in some states that's considered a disability. Not in Texas, though. So. Yeah, no, I, I, I assume last year told me that in some states actually uh, serving the military being overseas is considered a disability. That, that kind of makes sense, right? But uh, Texas, we got two, and that's it. And my return, what unsound mind means, I'm, I'm guessing that's a pretty high standard. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. 
pretty low standard of, of, of mental cognition to be unsound, but I'm not sure. Other questions? Okay. The book had a brief note, which is only worth mentioning in passing, about adverse possession against the government. I think someone asked me about this in the last class. Generally, the rule is you can't squat against the government, right? There's this old uh, uh, British maxim that says, no time runs against the king, and we've effectively <laughs> adopted that. Um, so, generally speaking, if a person sleeps on the same sidewalk, a public sidewalk, for 10 years, that person will not get the sidewalk. But there are private sidewalks, one of which maybe you've been to Rockefeller Center. Has anyone ever been to Rockefeller Center in New York? Today show, The Big Tree, right? There is a private sidewalk in Rockefeller Center that millions of people walk across every day. Once a year, usually at some point in the summer, a Sunday, they shut the sidewalk down for a full day. Why do they shut the sidewalk down for a full day? Even more than that. Because? It's not continuous, right? They're afraid that someone might perhaps not live on the sidewalk, but cross the sidewalk every single day for a decade, right? And they could actually kind of prescriptive right, the same way that Von Valkenberg and Lutz, so he would cross the lot every day. They, don't, they want to block it. So by closing the sidewalk one day a year, they're blocking any conceivable claim to adverse possession. This is still legitimate, yeah. But I mean, they're allowing people to walk across the sidewalk, so wouldn't that be not possible there? They're allowing but isn't closing it one year means it's maybe not so free? Ah, uh, they're, they're lawyers, right? Their lawyers are not willing to take that chance, right? Their lawyers said, okay, we could probably win by saying it's permissive and it's not hostile, but let's just eliminate any possibilities because what if some dude walks there every day lives across the street? He can actually have a prescriptive easement to that sidewalk, okay? And think about this. If you have a prescriptive right to cross it and NBC or GE or Universal wants to sell that plot of land, you are now a stakeholder. You now have a stick in that bundle, if you will. And, 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 and Rockabell essentially needs your permission not to sell this land. They want a fee simple, to use, to, use, to use the lingo of last semester. I probably won't use that word often. But they want a fee simple. They don't want any adverse claims. Sir? No, they put, they put barricades up. They actually block the sidewalk. For I mean, they, <laughs> I'm sure you can Google this online, but they actually have it. In fact, I think there was some guy... Uh, this was in the Times ago, who loved the Today Show, and he would go there every single day uh, uh, for like 30 years, and he would stand outside the studio when they filmed the Today Show. And then one day, he stopped coming, and that's because he died. It was actually really sad. Like, he... No one, no one really... I mean... The guy didn't have really much family, didn't really have a lot of friends, and he would go there every day, and all the people at the show knew him. And like, even her profiles him in the paper, and then one day he stopped showing up, and that was his obituary. But he could have probably entertained a claim of prescriptive right to cross the land. I mean, it's not ridiculous. He did, actually, he didn't. He did it Monday through Friday, but the Today Show is only filmed Monday through Friday. I think. I think. I think that's okay. Yeah. Any hand? No. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on. All right. Let's talk about the art case. Anyone here like art? They don't even know who George O'Keefe is. Oh wow! Usually no one raises their hand. So so George O'Keefe is a uh, a painter of some repute. Uh, this is her, as photographed by her husband Alfred Stiglitz. Uh, uh, she actually had an affair with Stiglitz, who then Stiglitz then left his wife for her. Um, he photographed her a lot naked. I won't even. But much of her artwork is very um, how do I put it. Uh, Related to the female anatomy. For example, this is a painting called Cliffs. Uh, this is another very famous painting called Seaweed. You can use your or not imaginations. But she's a very, very prominent uh, uh, artist. She actually lived to the age of 93. Uh, she died in 1980, effectively right after this decision came down. She, she died. Um, died in 1986, so a couple years afterwards. Okay. So this case involves what you might think is a criminal law case, right? People think, why is this a property case? The dude stole the painting, right? Well, the same way we have adverse possession limitations, you have criminal 
limitations, right? In criminal law, you have a statute of limitations. You can't bring a claim against someone who committed a crime 30 years ago. Uh, I believe in most jurisdictions, murder has no statute of limitations, but virtually all crimes do. So you might say trespass, burglary, whatever, possession of stolen property, whatever crime, that doesn't count. So instead, Ms. O'Keefe was trying to have the painting, which was of considerable value, returned to her. All right? So let's, let's walk through the facts of this case. So, ma'am, what's your name? Kelsey. Kelsey. Can you walk through the facts just at, at a high level, then we'll drill down. Um, she basically files a complaint that um, some of her paintings were stolen from the gallery in New York in 1946. Mm -hmm. um, I think she filed the first one to be stolen, but then the rest of them she kind of gave and she didn't want her mm -hmm. husband to find out about them. And the years have passed, and then they're claiming that this man, uh, Snyder, was the one who stole them, but then he's making a relation back to the guy that he has actually bought them from, mm -hmm. who he claims that he is actually related to her husband, mm -hmm. in a sense. Okay, good. <laughs> okay, good. That's, that's good for now. All right, so... The long and short of this is that there were several paintings that were stolen in the 1940s from Miss O'Keefe's studio. Uh, the circumstances are actually somewhat unclear, and it seems she either knew about it or didn't want to know about it. It's unclear. But she didn't want to tell anybody about it because it would upset her husband for reasons that even are even less clear. But she knew the paintings were stolen. She didn't call the police. She didn't take any proactive efforts to have the paintings returned. Okay? So, generally speaking, if someone steals something from you and you know about it, you call the police, you make a police report, you try to get it back, right? And if the police don't find it, find it a certain period of time, you're usually out of luck, right? By the way, has everyone followed the issue of Teresa Romer? I found this fascinating for property respects. Does everyone know who this woman is with the closet? Okay, so there's this woman in the woodlands, right? She's been all over the news. She has a million-dollar closet filled with expensive shoes and bags and jewelry, and she's been all over TV bragging how she all these expensive bags and shoes and whatever, right? So someone breaks into her closet and starts stealing stuff, and he's stealing really expensive bags and shoes and jewelry, right? Okay, and she was all upset, like, oh, these people broke in, and there's like, you know, can you find the surveillance footage online, right? So then, last week, a uh, call was placed by this burner phone, you can throw these numbers away, to the Houston Press. And the guy goes, I broke into Teresa Romer's closet, and all the stuff is fake. All the girls just went, oh, yeah. <laughs> all the clothes, the jewelry, and the bags are all fake. And he sent to the reporter some of the jewelry, which was all knockoff. It was party jewelry. <gasps> oh, my God, right? This is funny. I love this class. So, <laughs> so his, he was actually trying to extort her. He said... I will return the stuff to you if you give me money and I won't make this public. Because he, he said he was going to try and blackmail her to say that she has all this fake stuff because she was like a socialite, right? This is like her, she like showing like beauty patches and stuff. So instead, she wouldn't pay up the half million dollars to pay the bribe uh, ransom and he mailed the stuff to the press. And this was on the Today Show, Good Morning America, how now uh, this woman had all this fake jewelry. And she's like, oh, well, that was party jewelry. That wasn't the real stuff. But um, it was featured in all these photographs she had taken of her closet. So... Uh, stolen property is a, is, a, is a big deal. But in this case, they did manage to somehow find it. So at some point in the 1970s, O'Keefe learns about uh, these paintings open on some art show somewhere. And she now she's world famous, and these paintings are probably worth a lot of money, so she takes steps to demand their return. And Snyder says, nah, I'm not going to do it. Snyder claims that uh, he got it from someone else, another person got it from his father, and the painting was hanging in his father's study for all these years, and none of the years quite match up. But the key question in this case, right, is when does the clock start ticking? Right? And actually, to answer this question, when the clock's not ticking, it's told, right? It's put on pause. So at what point does the clock start ticking in this case? And in, in this instance, there was a six-year statute of limitation period. Yes? I wasn't asking. I'll get to it. Right? I'm not there yet. I'll get there. Right? So the court first basically says 
we can't decide who is the correct owner here, right? The facts are so messed up and everything's so disjointed. Everyone seems to be lying or telling half-truths. We don't know. So instead, we think that this issue should go back to the jury, right? Okay. I think that's a sensible resolution of the case. Now, Emily, Jim? Michelle. Michelle, why doesn't the case end there? Wouldn't the correct posture be, as an appellate court, we can't decide on the record who gets it, remand for a trial, let the jury figure it out? Why, why did the case not stop there? I think that they wanted to try to set up the law for this certain situation through stolen chattel. Why? Why would the court do that? Um, well, it's a Jersey thing, for one. Um, this, we will come back to this. The New Jersey Supreme Court was actually very active in this era of trying to change and shift property doctrine. And you're, you're exactly right. They were trying to change the law concerning the loss of stolen property. Okay? Because if you look at this from a very literal perspective, right, very strictly, um, you know what's your name? Claire, Claire, how often will anyone know where stolen property is? Not very often. Even if you're Teresa Romer and some dude tries to blackmail with your knockoff bags, right? Uh, usually don't know about these things. So the rule governing adverse possession for real property, like land, doesn't fit well into this rubric. If someone's squatting on Blackacre or squatting on a beach home, you can at least take a survey and figure it out. But if some guy has a painting hanging in his, in his house for 30 years, you might never know about it. Right? So, okay. So what's your name? David. David. So what happens, what does the court do here instead of just remanding and let the jury figure out? They, they, they develop a doctrine here. Yes, they go through... Uh the rule of discovery and okay. how, how it plays out. Process. Okay. So, so tell me, what's this? What's this rule of discovery? Um, the statute of limitations doesn't start ticking until um, the property is discovered mm -hmm. uh, to be stolen. Um, okay. Good. Well, more precisely, when does the clock? Uh, two gentlemen to your right. What's your name, sir? Blaine. Blaine. More specifically, when does discovery occur? When does the clocks are ticking. That, that's good, but I'm asking when does the cause of action accrue, right? When does the when does the clock start ticking? The six year clock. They give two different standards. No, no. I'm looking for. Sir, what's your name? Uh, Stephen. Stephen. When, when does the clock start ticking from Miss O'Keefe's perspective? Uh, she wants to say when she, when she first knew. Good. Okay. The standard the court reaches is the clock starts ticking when the owner of the property knew or should have known. Everyone knows the difference. I mean, you see this a lot in law, but let's break this down. N knew or should have known. What's the difference between those two? Sir, what's your name? Sorry, what's your question? Alex. Alex, what's the difference between knew or should have known? What's the difference? Um, well, if you knew it, I guess... Um, what, what's the significance of a should have known? Well, that brings in the reason they prove Ah, good. Right? New is what we might call an objective standard. You see this a lot in the law, right? It's a verifiable fact that she knew. Should have known is what we might call subjective, or use the magic word, reasonable person standard, right? Would a reasonable person in this situation have known? Would a reasonable person have done the due diligence? I think Blaine mentioned that a second ago done the due diligence to go out and, you know, look around to try and find it. Right? So what happens? What happens if she, say, in, I don't know, 1975, 
that you should have known, I don't know, like 1950, you know, right? What happens when she, act, she actually found out in 1975, whatever, but she should have known 50 years earlier. Sam, what's your name? Suhei. Suhei? What do we do in a case where a reasonable person would have found this out 30 years earlier? Does she, does she win here? Which which one do you do? Do the earlier date or the later date? I would do the later date. Which one is it? The 1950s. That's right. You work with the earlier date, right? If she only found out five, but she didn't, she should have known thirty years earlier, right? That's because she was being lazy or not being attentive or not being diligent. She wasn't enforcing her own rights. So this new or should have known standard is objective and subjective, right? So even if she didn't find out until 1975, a reasonable person probably would have taken steps 30 years earlier to, to find this painting. Now, what if, if, again, the painting was hanging in the guy's living room, right? Now, what's your name? Danielle. Danielle, is there any way for a reasonable person to know that the painting's hanging in this person's living room? No. So, so this 1950 date is probably a little bit of an exaggeration. There's no way for uh, Miss, Miss whatever, uh, Miss O'Keefe to know it was hanging there. But she could have done other things. For example, what's your name? Uh, Joseph. Joseph, what else could she have done? I mean, the court says that she should have uh, like reported it stolen instead of just telling her friends and then you know, several years later reporting it to some organization. And uh, they say that, you know, there's not really a good way for people to know if the thing is stolen when they're buying it. Yes. Have to have it, but you have done okay, very good. She could have reported to the police. There were these international art groups that kept track of stolen paintings in case anyone tried to pawn them or sell them. So there were different steps which a reasonable artist, right, could have taken under the circumstances. Did she do any of this? No, she didn't. Okay. So, uh, what's your name? Tyler, what do you think happened here on remand after the court sent it back uh, for discovery? Um, With the discovery rule, I mean. I mean, I think that they probably went with the you know, they went with the objective, but I think they probably should have gone with the uh, should have known standard. Right. I think it seems a little bit more fair that Maybe not fair, but she should have done something instead of just waiting around for 25 years. Right, she didn't enforce her own rights. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, what's your name? Morgan. Morgan? Let me ask you a different question. Generally, in adverse possession, who has the burden to, that you've been on a piece of land for a number of years? The squatter, right? It's flipped here, right? Usually, the squatter has the burden of showing they've been in the land for X years. Morgan, you hear who has the burden? Morgan? Okay. Who has the burden in this case? Um, the O'Keefe. Right. So usually the owner of the property doesn't have the burden. Here with the courts on they actually shifted the burden to the owner, which is kind of weird. Okay. Uh, let's see, one other uh, oh, what's your name? Samaya. Let's talk about open and notorious, right? This painting was in the dude's living room for twenty something years. Is it ever gonna be the case? that these chattels are openly notoriously held? Probably not. So what should the court do, or what did the court do, to deal with that problem? I'm sorry, louder please? So why, what, how did the court handle that? I think I think we already said a couple different ways. What what did the court change in the four elements of adverse possession to make that not much of an issue? Um, when she finds out that yes, exactly. So the reason why the discovery rule is relevant is because the open and notorious prong never works. A painting hanging in some guy's living room will never be openly and notoriously displayed. That's why the second it becomes known, which means the second it becomes notorious, you start the clock. Everyone see that? Once it becomes open and notorious, you start running the clock. If it's hidden in a living room, it can't be open and notorious. So 
in this one sense, this isn't that much of a departure, right? One way of looking at it is saying, well, as long as it was, as it was hanging in the guy's living room, it wasn't open and notorious. It only became open and notorious when it was publicly displayed, and that's when she should have known, and that was in the 1975, and that's when the clock started ticking, and that's when she brought the suit. Yep. Yes, sir. Um, so you think she should have dropped the thing? So. It depends how you define open and notorious, right? If you impose some sort of duty on the squatter to know about the state of her property, she failed in that duty. So we use the example of someone said, what happens if your summer home is in a different state, right? You don't go and check there. I think I said, well, if you own a home in some state, you probably have a caretaker go and check on it. It's a little bit of a different story than we're talking about a piece of personal property like a painting, right? It's not a house you have to attend to. Although I'm pretty sure she should have followed a police report or something. They're in the gallery. They're not there. On the equities, I think it's very hard to give the painting back to Ms. O'Keefe. I think it's very hard to roll in her favor. Sir? Um, you said the court shifted the burden. Is that just this court or generally? That's court? rare. This is a New Jersey. It's a Jersey thing. Um, the the court kind of manufactured this doctrine of whole cloth. I think they started from a reasonable premise. They said, "Listen, it wasn't open and notorious because it was hanging in the guy's living room, so we'll we'll start the clock when she found it." But everything else they kind of made up. But generally speaking, we would have On the squatter. Yes, sir. Yep. Let's say that the owner posts on like. There was no online in the 1980s, okay. but, but 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 you're absolutely right. There are today international registries where you can post stolen art, and they actually have pretty sophisticated um, uh, uh, investigators. For example, just as last year, there was a story that broke somewhere in Europe where uh, this guy died, and he left to his son an entire apartment full of Nazi paintings. Right, and you know they they have been missing for 60 years. So this stuff does happen. Yes, ma'am? So when you say the burden of proof is on the owner... O'Keefe. O'Keefe, to prove that she didn't know? To prove when she learned about it. When she learned about it, so... Or when she should have learned about it, or something yeah. like that. So who, who would bring the argument that she didn't know? Like, the, the Snyder. He'll say she should have known in 1950. Right? So he's going to bring something up in the Yeah. He's going to say that it's... Uh, so another hand. Um, well, actually, no. The question is new subjective. I think that new is an objective fact. Did she actually know versus subjective? Should she have known? Uh, but, but you can go back and forth with that. Um, as, as it happens, on remand, after this case, the party settled out of court. Um, they kind of split the difference. O'Keefe took one painting. Snyder took the other one. And they sold the third one at Sotheby's on auction, and I think they split the balance. So they actually reached what I think is a pretty decent settlement. Okay. What else? Other questions? Anything else? All right. Have a good weekend. Take care.